Welcome back, everybody, to another edition of the B&H Virtual Event Space. For those of you who always wondered what happens when you put 10 different people in a Zoom room on the B&H Event Space, <laughs> you are about to find out. So uh, <laughs> we've, got, we've got Monica. We got to 10. Yeah. <laughs> I guess he missed the elementary school. Did I miss it? Did I miss it? Did I miss it? That's it. He's off. He's off. And 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 we've got we've got Tim and Bev. You know what? He didn't make ten years. And we're talking about the four cornerstones of a successful portrait business. We've got Derek Fossbender, my beard brother, in the background, in the flesh. We're all here. Everybody's here from the event space today. We're excited. Uh, just a reminder to everybody who's joining. We hope you're just as excited as we are. We want you to ask questions, okay? So this is only going to work if you ask questions. So make sure you get them in. It doesn't matter what it's about because we're talking about portraits and running a portrait business and how to do that successfully. So whether it's Zoom, Vimeo, Facebook, wherever you're joining from, get them in and we'll make sure to pass them on. I'm going to hand off the torch to Monica and Michael so they can kickstart this event. And uh, I'm hanging out. I'm excited. I'm, I'm just dying because, okay, so first of all, we love you guys so much. We love being age. And second of all, I think Tim and Bev and Rod right now are like, seriously, what did they get us into? <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. They're like the one guy can't count. Monica can't stop laughing. So, um, but anyway, we are super, super excited to be back. And thank you, BNH, for having us again. We're glad you're not sick of us. Um, and then we're super excited to have our dear friends with us. So, for those of you who um, maybe don't know us, I'm Monica Sigmund. This is Michael Taylor. <laughs> I'll say it for you. <laughs> That's fine. I'll just nod my head. It's normal. And we have a portrait studio in Williamsburg, Virginia, um, uh, kind of a luxury model. So mm -hmm. low volume, high touch, lots of client experience. And we're joined. We asked our uh, dear friends, Rod Evans and Bev and Tim Walden to, to join us for this program because this is our own little mastermind group. We get together every other Thursday, you know, come hell or high water, like religion for 90 minutes. And we talk marketing and this is like our safe space. And these are our people that we can come to the table and say, you know what, I'm struggling with this, or I need help with this. And, you know, one of the things that Michael and I talk about a lot is leveling up and being with people that make you be better. You know, it's fun to be at the top of the pack, but you don't learn that way. So we're very glad to be at the bottom of this pack and be in their company <laughs> and, and stretch and learn. And so, um, so we're excited. Did you want to say anything before? I pass it over no, I'll just say, I agree. How about, how about that? Huh? Yeah. Oh, man. It, it, yeah. Okay, oh, so Michael is I, a smart man over here. Yeah. <laughs> I trained him well. So, um, so I will pass it along to Rado and um, and to the Waldens to introduce themselves, and then we'll get started. Rod, you want to go first? Sure. My name is Rod Evans, and I have a studio in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and kind of the same thing, you know, uh, kind of a specialty business model. Um, I primarily just do families <laughs> and some high school seniors. Uh, and that's pretty much all we do. And again, we try to give them a great experience and fine art type of look to our work. And so that's our story. And I've been doing it for about 30 years. Nice. All right. Well, hey, I'm Tim Walden, and we are excited to be here. My wife, Beverly, my better half by my side. Uh, it takes two of us, I guess, to make uh, make one photographer, but uh, that's yeah. okay. We, we, we do this together, and we enjoy it. I was raised by a a photographer uh, raised in a dark room, fine art printing. I've been doing this. Uh, we don't need to talk about how long, but <laughs> for a long, long time in Lexington, Kentucky, horse country, bourbon country, uh, right here. And uh, yes, somebody's shaking their head. Yeah, bourbon country. Bourbon. And uh, we've got a, a, a brand here that's also a very uh, high end brand, a luxury brand, as, as you would say, very specialized. Uh, black and white is my passion, um, telling stories through through relationship style portraiture. And then um, we do a lot of color work and Beverly does a lot of painter work and does a lot of mixed media pieces and uh, just kind of living the dream. So we're thrilled to be 
part of this. We're honored to be part of this and we're excited to get started. And I think Monica, you, you had a couple of things that we're going to get us kicked off. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So this is a four part series. Um, and tonight's just the first night. So we're going to break it down into, um, kind of the common denominators that we feel that all of our studios have in common, um, that have enabled us to have successful businesses for a few decades now. So when we sat and talked, um, we boiled it down. And so we're going to start tonight with branding and we have other topics for the other weeks, but I'm going to kick it off with a couple of slides and this, um, these may be a little bit familiar to some of you, but it's a good place to kick us off. And so let's see, are you guys seeing the Sigmund Taylor screen right now? Yes, yes, definitely. Right? Yep. Okay. Yes? Correct. Yes. yes. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, so we're going to start with what brand is not. And I think um, the biggest misconceptions about brand is that A, brand equals marketing. And we know that that's not true. It's so much more. And the other thing that I think um, that we hear from a lot of photographers is they think that brand is what is defined by their clients or by their marketplace. And they think of it more as kind of a passive assignment instead of us being intentional and really choosing the brand that we want. And so when people ask, well, how do we figure out what our brand is or how do we decide? I always say that there's a couple of questions that we have to answer. And I know, Tim, you're going to elaborate on this, but the importance of getting it defined clearly and consistent, consistently is because we want to be the sending the same message across everything we do, say, share, write, um, put out in the public. And so we want the brand to feel familiar to our clients and consistent. So I always say, what is it that you want to shoot? In other words, what do you want your work to look like? Rado has clearly defined his market down to seniors and families. For instance, he's not going to do newborns or weddings. So he knows what his lane is and he's going to stay in that. Who do you want to work with? This is what will determine the clients. What do you want your clients to look like? And then how you attract them is what is going to determine your business model and your business culture. Sometimes I think we forget because we're solopreneurs or we have one other person in the studio with us or a partner in the studio with us. And sometimes I think it's easy to forget that you still have a culture. You can still have a culture. Your studio, um, if with your one person or 15 people, you can still have a culture and that's something that you wanna be imparting across every step of your client journey. So when you answer these questions, you come up with the art that you want to create, the way you're going to conduct your business, even the products that you want to offer. I'm guilty of, of running down a trade show and I, I love so many different products, but I have to kind of rein myself back in and say, well, I love this, but that's not necessarily in our brand. So we've got to just maybe hold on that and I can enjoy it from afar. And so those are the things that we have to think about. And then also the experience for the client. So when we can define all of these, we get super clear on our vision. And then that's what ultimately determines our brand. So we want to decide what it is that we want to be known for and then communicate that in everything that we do. Right, Tim? Absolutely. You know, I think and I noticed you had your art and your photography right at the top. And I really think as photographers, we have a huge advantage in the fact that we can build our brand around our style. The problem a lot of times is we don't define our style. So it becomes difficult to define your brand. The tighter you define your style, the easier you're going to find that it is to define your brand because everything is a style decision and your brand is an is a culmination of everything you do. Uh, it's been said that your brand is what other people say about you when you're not in the room. And I think that's, a, that's very true. And, and, but we have an advantage in the fact that we can define our art form. And I think in today's market, you have to define an art form that's unique, that's different from, from what others do. Something, go places where the masses can't go, but also I think to, to carve it down to where it becomes recognizable. And the more recognizable that you are, the easier it's going to be to make branding decisions. 
if your style is a playful style of photography. You got people, you know, playing in front of a white background, jumping on a on a trampoline and you're taking these shots, you're not going to have Victorian style furniture in your studio. You're going to dress a certain way. You're going to talk a certain way. So your style is at the heart of your brand. And I think for, for us, once we knew our style was more about our relationship, black and white, fine art, telling people stories, then we began to build the experience. And Monica, you talked about experience around that. Uh, we began to ask people, tell us your story. Tell us, you know, if this portrait is a chapter in your life, what's the bold print? And then we began to build portraits with a strong emotional tag. And then we made everything about their experience here wrap around that. And I think we have a huge advantage. And, and I think it really starts with being less concerned that people like what you do, as odd as that sounds, and more concerned that they know what you do. And as they know what you do and you begin to recognize it, you can now lay out your, the, the, the cornerstones of your brand and support that style all the way through, form people's expectations and then fulfill them. I wanted to talk about uh, the personal part that touches me is the art, because to me, that is your heart. And that is each of us are artists. We happen to be photographers, and that's how we produce our art, but each of us are artists. I find it very interesting that many of my photographer friends right now are going into painting, like with a brush and paint. I paint a different way, uh, but you're, when you're trying to find what you want to do, just reach back into your childhood and Try to remember what made you happy, what gave you joy, what, you know, like when I started shooting, it wasn't the black and white brand that our studio is known for. Uh, I kind of married photography. I, I didn't evolve with generations before me that were photographers, but I kind of came into it from an art and language background. And what made me happy were, was beauty beautiful things, grace, lovely colors, uh, coordination, things that when I looked at it, my heart just would jump and my heart would sing. And uh, so when I came into photography, what I wanted to do was to kind of develop that part of me and that art. Now, what was funny is at that time, the studio was taking off with the black and white relation, we call them relationship portraits. It was the iconic style that we uh, became very much known for. I didn't know how to do it. I was like, Tim, you need to teach me how to shoot these relationship portraits because it wasn't what I was used to shooting. I, I loved doing beautiful color, vintage, fairy tale type things. Um, so, but in order to define our brand, to keep our brand consistent, when it was the days that I was in charge of the camera room, I had to learn how to do that type of work and, and it would be appropriate for the studio uh, to do. So, and then, you know, when he had a color portrait, I kind I could help him too. So it does take. Lord two. knows I need help. <laughs> <laughs> it, it takes. It really takes both of us to yeah. to do to, you know to run the studio. I mean, I don't know what I if it was me alone, I would do something else. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Rado, why don't you jump in? So that's so true, Bev, and all of you guys are right. I'm just. Super honored to be here, but I'll tell my journey of kind of how I got what more my feelings about branding are and and how that all fits into our business. So for me, um, you know, my first studio was by the penitentiary. It's pretty awesome. So it's <laughs> literally three blocks from the penitentiary. It was it is not a nice neighborhood, obviously. <laughs> it's a very seedy um, neighborhood. And so I knew that that's not where I wanted to be for the rest of my life. And this is what I was, where I was going to be. So I just pre-visualized what I would do in the future. So this is how I came up with my brand and my style is that I pretended I was the client and what I would see, smell, hear when I walked through the studio, what it would look like, sound like the experience, 
the session, the work that was being produced, the products that were being produced, how it was being delivered, every, like you could feel it. Like when you walk through and you just, you could touch all your senses were being, were being um, attacked, you know, by, by what I was putting in my mind to do this, um, to have this studio like that. So hard to do when you're in by the penitentiary and you're literally backing <laughs> through like my camera rooms in one room and then the sales rooms next to it, I cut a hole in the sales room so I could back up and shoot through the door so I could do more than one person at a time. This, it was so small. So I'm in the other room, you know, taking pictures from the other room through the doorway and then trying to say that, you know, I'm this artist that's creating blah, 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 or whatever. But you know what? I, I We did it. So, and it was hard, but somebody told me this statement, which is, you're just telling the truth in advance of who you are, you know, and of, of where you're going to be. You're setting that boundary. You're setting where you're going to be. And a lot of times we're our own worst enemy. We think we can't do that. We're held back by this or that, but we're mostly held back by ourselves. So when you go to decide and, and define who you are and what your style is, don't let all the outside elements stop you from doing that. You create that and then the rest will follow. So yeah, so now I'm in this, you know, studio uh, that I would have, you know, dreamed of, and I did dream of actually, this is what I, what I dreamed my studio would look like. And so that's where I'm at and my business from $8 eight by tens um, and uh, uh, being at the penitentiary, you know, to, just moving to a business model like this instead. So if I can do it, you can. <laughs> no, I wanted uh, I wanted to jump in real quick and, and, and ask a question. I mean, this is this is a, a free for all question, and obviously everyone's going to have their own take on this. But in creating branding, obviously when it, when all of you started out, I don't imagine that you you know intrinsically knew what it was exactly that you had planned on doing. I mean, maybe, maybe for, for Tim, because, you know, he, he had that in his lineage, he already kind of maybe had that path sort of carved out a little bit, but when is it acceptable for somebody in creating that brand to start really honing in on that? Because I think once you, once you start out in photography, you're not really sure maybe what you want to do and how you want to approach it. At what point do you start making those moves and saying, okay, this is where I'm going to start investing my energy. And now I'm going to start putting in that branding. So I, you, I actually have a question for you, but you didn't go about this the normal way. So I'm going to jump in and, and answer okay. this one because you came out like of the womb kind of knowing what you want to do like, I feel, so yeah. I feel like the rest of us who had to like muddle through this and it's actually funny because you posted our graphic our b &H graphic that we have with the three of us and six portraits on uh social media today and you said guess which one is mine and everybody knew which portrait was yours which I think speaks to how clear you've been in your brand and style but I don't think to your question, Scott, I don't think there's a magic formula. I think that when we start out, we do try a bunch of different things to see what fits well and, and what we enjoy. And I think that it's also something that evolves over time and you can improve and hone. But um, for me, I think the answer is when you, for instance, if you have a session today at four o'clock and say it's a newborn session and you're just like, oh my God, I hope they cancel, right? Like, I hope the kid gets sick. I hope something happened. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, cause you, cause you don't want to photograph that session. Then that's a really good indicator of probably that's something you don't want to, you know, really build into your permanent business model. So I think that when you are feeling excited about each and every session, when you're excited to try new things, play with new gear, try something different, then you're, you're kind of settling into where it is you're supposed to be, wouldn't you say? Yeah, you know, I think the most important thing, and, you know, the thing is, I, I was lucky. I mean, when I was in first grade, my dad was in the Air Force, and we were in Japan, I signed myself up for an oil painting class at adult education. I mean, who does that? You know, that was just ridiculous. It Michael was Taylor it was that. me and Rod 17, does that. <laughs> you know, 17 adults. And um, 
And when I had a little brownie, I was taking pictures of people. Uh, when I was in high school, I saved up my money and went down to the B. Dalton's bookstore and bought Arnold Newman's One Mind's Eye. You know, mm -hmm. this iconic book that Arnold uh, created. Um, when I started taking a high school photography class, the only thing I did was take portraits of people. Um, I'm Facebook friends with the first person I ever did a professional sitting of in high school, you know, so I was fortunate. Well, he liked her and he didn't know how to talk to her. Well, she was a cheerleader so, and how could I ever oh, here we go. Yeah. He yeah. wasn't yeah. talk to her. He wasn't yeah. creepy at all. Oh, oh, yeah. Rod. oh, Rod, what's your take on this, Rod? <laughs> <laughs> I, I did get $25 for doing this, though, you know. You paid her so, $25? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not so, creepy at all. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, but I think, you know, but seriously, I think the most important thing is that you need to listen to yourself. You because you're gonna you, we all like things, have passion about things. There there's styles that we gravitate to, uh, certain photographers that we love. So you know the hard thing is to really listen to what you love to do. And I know? think you have to be forward thinking. I think you have to think not only not only do I love doing this now but I'm going to love doing this for a long time because right. right about the time that we get tired of it is when our marketplace starts to recognize it. Absolutely. And so it can't be for us. I think it can't be a, like a, a real fad or, or something that we're going to get tired of. No, I think, you know, if you listen to yourself and you have this true style that you're doing and that you're passionate about and that you're creating new things, it, there's joy in it. I mean, Derek, photographing your son, it's raining. We have people all around us. We're in Central Park. And I'm having joy because we got some great portraits of your son. And he was connecting with me, you know? We got some cool representational portraits. Then we went around the corner and uh, stuff. In between Park. his meditation. Yeah, and <laughs> your, your son's Can't meditation, that. you know? <laughs> but, you know, so, you know, I'm lucky that I love, environmental location portraits, you know, indoors, outdoors. So I find joy in solving problems out there uh, to be able to bring all these elements together to create that portrait. So it's yeah. 43 years now of doing professional portraits and I still find joy in it. So, you know, we need to, uh, we A, we need to learn to search, which is really look around uh, to find, look at images, look at people, look at the work that photographers are doing but we need to absorb it too. You know, we have to have this library of images that are inside of us that we draw from because, you know, portraits are, if they really have truth to them, there's going to be an element of being a self-portrait also because it has to be a reflection of us. And when we're doing something that has truth to it, uh, we're going to really enjoy it. And I think we're going to have true passion for it. So it's the most important thing what, is to listen to What was to the question? <laughs> <laughs> it was about how do you find your style? Okay. Yeah, I love it. I, I I'll chime a, in. I, I a, oh, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, was go that, ahead. I couldn't see who. We got so many people on here. No, I was going to throw out another yeah, question, but 10, no. I, hear. Yeah, I know. We have 10 people. <laughs> yeah, we got all, all 10 of us yeah. on here. That's, that's, a, that's yeah. I'm, a, I'm a product uh, of, of the New York City public school. school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm going to get some hate mail for that. But but Derek, you had a question. Go for it. No, well, well mine was actually related to back when, when Rod, when you were giving your intro and talking about location, that's one thing that, you know, Scott and I here, being from New York, it's like, there's always a market is there's a constant market you can find everything in a condensed place where when we have viewers from all over the world how much does location play a key in what kind of market you can establish does the existing market matter at all and if you wanted to take your product and elevate it and create a high-end portrait studio are we limited by the current market that's that is where we are and by where we live or, or what kind of area we live in. Wow. Hmm. 
think he aimed want. that at you, Rado. I think sure. he's yeah. Like, what does that have to go to me? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, you, you're um, next door to the prison. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> if you can do it for the well, I was getting a lot of money. I was doing really well actually by the prison. Guys were showing up with orange jumpsuits and passport photos. <laughs> It's a good start. <laughs> um, but in all honestly, I mean, that's a really great question. I, there, there is some factors there. If you have to be honest, I mean, there really is. If you're in a city of 80 people, that's going to be pretty tough. So you're going to have to reach out much farther than that. It, I don't know if it has as much to do with you know, the community and the size of the community and the affluence, you know, how many affluent people are in your community. I think that does have a factor in it. It has to. You have to find people that have um, expendable income, obviously, um, to do what you do. Now, not, not all of our clients are that. Some of them save up for years to come to us, but you certainly have um, a certain part of your market that does that. And so you have to create the want or the desire for those people to come to you. So you have to have that brand, that look that attracts the client that you're looking for. And you have to be, you have to be seen by them multiple times, obviously, and and in the same way. You know, when I first started, I had like 16 fonts on a mailing piece and, you know, and- Did Michael color. design them for you? <laughs> yeah, and, I, did, and I, I had like every, type of photograph you could think of. There'd be a dog, there'd be a, you know, a family, a senior, a baby. Oh, it didn't matter. You know what I mean? And then that was my man, you know, so it was all over the place. But once you have something that people are drawn to and excited about, I think that's, that's one of the key elements, but also obviously there are external factors. Absolutely. You can't get away from that. Yeah, so absolutely. you might have to take your show on the road. <laughs> so, Tim, why don't you why don't you jump in? I can see. Yeah, I was going to I was going to add something to that because Rado is exactly right. Um, it's not the same across the board, but I, I would encourage people to to un, to to think a, a little differently in the fact that I mean we're in a community that's a decent size. We're certainly not in New York City, but it's not it's not a hole in the wall, but it's kind of medium to small. But I think as you expand your offerings too, it's very important that you have different ones that are very distinguishable. Because I think one, sometimes what we do is we throw everything in the bug, I'll do this, I'll do this, and I'll do that. And then we're not recognized. Part of your success is in finding something that's recognizable mm -hmm. as something that has an emotional tag to it. That's been a key for us. And then when you go out to brand or, or to, to message this, what you're what, what, what I, my, my favorite definition of a successful brand is that you, a successful brand forms expectations and then fulfills them. So basically everybody comes to you with an expectation. It doesn't matter whether you want them to or not, they're going to come with one. The mm -hmm. question becomes, are you fulfilling that expectation? And if you don't form it, fulfilling it becomes very challenging because you don't know what that expectation is it could be from something so random you have no way of knowing so for us we have different offerings three different offerings they're all of the same caliber but they're all very different and we message we brand message those with like we call branding chunks just little pieces of messages very differently and then when we go into a session we don't do everything we know how to do we hyper focus start with vision in mind and we find out when they come through our door, like, which direction are we going to take? So now we know what type of art we're going to create. And then we just simply stay in that lane and kind of fulfill that. And I can tell you from experience, you can be busy and still struggle because as these guys were tired of hearing this, but when I took over from my father, he was financially well to do. And when I took over, I wasn't, <laughs> we were broke. <laughs> and, and our business was on the fast track to bankruptcy. I mean, we were heading downhill fast. And I remember Bev and I, we said, you know, if I'm going to go out of business, I want to go out of business doing something I love. This is not what I love. I hate jumping through hoops, being everything to everybody. We started the thing that touched our heart. This goes back to what we talked about earlier, finding something that really makes your heart beat faster. And like Monica says, that's going to help you as time goes by. You're not going to tire of it. Mm -hmm. So we started doing that. And I thought, well, if I'm going to go out of business, I want to do something that I love because I don't love doing all these things. 
And in a short period of time, it turned our business around. It was something we had no clue about, but as we began to execute what was very defined and very much our passion, it began to rise to the top and allowed us to leverage our business, all the other things we were doing, uh, the things away we didn't want to do, and then to begin to hone in on the things we were doing with more uh, conciseness and more of our passion. I think all of us in the beginning have done everything. I mean, at one point we were doing passports, copy restoration, proms, weddings, Santa. Singers, <laughs> you name it. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> and yes. And we okay. didn't, we, I didn't like that. I didn't like it. And when you, I, I read a quote, I don't know it exactly, but when you do, when you do everything, you water down what you really want to do. You're, you're, people can't find you because you look like everybody else doing everything. But we are all guilty. I feel like in the beginning, you have to make money. I think we didn't do sports teams, thankfully. Uh, but we did schools. I mean, everything, believe it or not. People that know us now would not believe we ever did schools. Uh, but um, as we could, and I think you said the best word to use it, we leveraged. We, we started deciding we're going to do those black and white portraits, tell stories. We're going to do them differently than anybody's ever seen. And it was in a world at the time that was leaving black and white behind and doing color. Color had just come in. We were like, we're doing black and yeah, white. Let's not you tell know, them how like, far back this like, was. Oh, you know. <laughs> we actually loaded a camera. That was like, duh. <laughs> and, the yeah, and, and so we, we, we took a risk. I mean, it's a risk when you run your own business anyway. Um, and we took a risk, but we decided let's do this. Let's price it appropriately. Let's bring it to the marketplace. Let's only market this. Let's brand it let's just hit the ground hard running with it and it took about three years for us constantly pushing 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 it to that it replaced it replaced all the other stuff we were doing with and it and it did more than replace it elevated our money it elevated our bottom line it allowed us to become the artists that we wanted to and we're doing it 25 years it time. later yeah. We're still loving it. We still, when you know, we still love when we when we see the expression on people's face when they see it and they cry. And you know, that's that's my story. You know, it's a story. It was storytelling in a world of Olin Mills smile for the camera color. You know, well, and, and so it was a real different take on things. And I think too, like what all of our studios have in common, because our work is very different, right? Like you can clearly tell, you know, we do black and white portraits, Rod does black and white portraits, but nobody does a black and white portrait like the Waldens. I mean, it's just, it's, it's distinct. You can see one behind Tim's shoulder there. I mean, you just, they're distinct, they're recognizable. There's a quality about them that, um, that, I mean, we can't, we can't, mimic and, and nor would we want to and that's that's the other pitfall I think that photographers fall into is we see somebody yeah. whose work we really admire and then we think okay that will solve all the problems let me do the work like this but we it, it's just mimicking and it's not authentic and you'll you'll tire mm -hmm. of it after you master right. it and right. I think that I think that one thing all of our studios do really well is that like Tim says you know we've we've been able to establish establish work that is different than the rest of the work in the marketplace, like trying to rise above the masses. So I see a question here from Travis. Hey, Travis, you're so kind to join us. We love you so much. Um, so he, he's asking, how have you built your photo brand to st stand out from all the others? And I think this, this is kind of what we're talking about right here, because if your work looks like everybody else's work, right? Like if you're, if you do family portraits and, and there's no distinction, like you're, nobody can pull you out from a lineup, your work out from a lineup, then there is no reason for people to call you. There's no difference. There's no, there's no incentive. There's nothing exciting about you. And so you have to 
pick a lane and just get so nuanced in that look that it can't be anybody else's work but yours. And then mm -hmm. when you're able to do that, when you're able to create that look that's just so unique and so defining, then they, if they want that look, they have to call you because you're the only one that can do it. Like if I want a true black and white relationship, classic portrait, I've got to drive to Kentucky and go get it from Tim and Beth. Like those are the people that do it. So I think that it's really important to, the more you can define and distinguish, define and distinguish, refine, define, you know what I mean? It's just like, and it's layers and layers. And, and I think it evolves over time, but I look at <clears throat> the work that I shot 20 years ago. And when I started and this, the scenes are different, maybe the locations are different, the studio style is different, but that emotion and those relationships and that storytelling is the same as what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so Travis is asking, you know, how have you built your photo brand? And Travis, by the way, we're still telling people about the Annie event. So I thank know. you for your putting so that amazing. together a couple of weeks ago. Now, you know, one of the interesting things about uh, Tim and Bev's studio and Broad studio and our studio is that one of the important product lines in all our studios is studio portraits. Mm -hmm. Now, there are so many photographers that are doing family portraits in our, in our business and they're natural light photographers. So they're outdoors, they're in parks, they're in beaches, things like that. So, you know, Right here are three great examples of how we're setting ourselves apart from mm -hmm. most photographers in our communities. You know, you have to do that. You have to find a different path. You know, if people are going to go to the right, I want to go to the left. I'm going Perfect. to go find a place uh, to the yes, left yes. to be able to photograph, you know, and you do have to find a product that's going to be attractive to some segment of the population, you know? Um, and the thing is, it's okay not to be something that everybody in your community wants. That's a great thing. We don't want yeah. that. You know, we, we are all segmented, you know, we all have a tiny section of our community that's going to really relate to our prices, our quality, the way we do business, mm -hmm. how much time it takes to create the products that we have. So you have to um, be okay with that and, and embrace that and have joy in doing that, you know, so. And I think too, I, I think too, a lot of it is your brand culture, you know? So when we think about like, okay, well, what's brand culture? So my favorite example of that is Apple right? Like Apple started completely the opposite. Apple built software first. They started with iTunes. We all fell in love with iTunes and then the hardware followed. We all wanted the iPod. And then that was so cool. Well, what's this little computer, right? Like everybody else starts with the hardware and tries to sell that first, but they started by solving something in our day-to-day -day life. They didn't start by selling the big computer, right? Like they, they warmed us up. Well, they were and trying to, you know, um, be the hard to come through the mm -hmm. hardware you know and it wasn't working right you know so they started really becoming successful when they did this turn right and and go through the software and the music and the ipod and, and things like that and having a whole family of products that you want to be part of i mean so, we don't put a lot of stickers on our car we're just we don't put stickers on our car but we put an apple sticker on our car why do we do that we don't even put a sigmund taylor no. sticker on the car but we put the apple sticker on the car because it's know. cute and it's a little apple <laughs> well, and it's a little but apple. um sure. their their That's first slogan are. apple's first slogan was think different mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that was their very very first and I mean, then they became known for like plug and play, like let's not have a million pages of how to figure out how to put this thing together. Let's just, it you take it out. Didn't you get like the little ear yeah, things I, and they I, just I, like, oh, bing, they were connected. Yeah, I ordered the AirPods, I got in the car and opened it up and my phone went bing, you're connected. I'm how like, wonderful. Now that more people need to think like that. How but wonderful. That, okay, that. boomer. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, whoa, this is great. <laughs> Hey, you know, I, I may be slow learning, but I do learn. So but um, I don't even have those things in my ear. They would fall out and get lost and the dog would eat them. So, you know, uh, uh, no. we, we did have a question. Someone asked if you can do a high end profitable business uh, out of a home. hundred percent. Absolutely. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, um, 
the first studio I was at, we actually did um, road trips and did work um, in Nashville and in, uh, in uh, Jackson, Mississippi and things like that. So we weren't, you know, really working out of a, a retail spot. And by just the way you carry yourself, the way you dress, um, how you handle clients, how you communicate, uh, the product that you you deliver, there's no problem. Yeah, yeah I think what you're a brick and mortar place. Mm -hmm. What you're saying, Michael, too, is, is that I think in a lot of ways is we have to be just more intentional. We do things sometimes haphazardly, and it's not that the decisions uh, that, that we make are wrong, is that we're not sitting down and making decisions. And I think if you structure and you're more intentional in what you do, that makes a, a huge difference. And so you look at it, you go, here's the way my brand is gonna function. I'm gonna work out of my home. I wanna do beautiful high-end work. What are the things that I can do to separate myself from the masses? Mm -hmm. How do I leverage this where I'm seen differently? And I think going back to, to the photography style, no matter where you're doing that, you can create a unique style. And I would tell most photographers, sometimes our worst enemies, our, our worst enemy is ourself. Because you know what you're doing that's different. You you can define it. It's like my lighting's a little better. My this is a little better. My that's a little mm -hmm. better. But the reality is, does the public see that? I think sometimes we have to give up good things for the greater things, you know? So we're not doing too many things. So what's the greater things I do? How do you create those wide leverages, those wide barriers where they begin to be recognized and then you begin to perfect them. And so I think being intentional when you're working out of your home or out of some place like that is the first The first key is, is defining it, following the process. And I'll tell you, your first plan may not be the perfect plan. It won't be, I can promise you that. No. But it's huh. the start to the perfect plan. I, when, when we do coaching or things like that, I'll tell people, go home and make a bad plan. Because everybody's like, oh, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I said, well, just make a bad one and let's fix it. You know, because I think it starts with pen to paper. What am I going to do? How do I dif distinguish myself from the masses? And then you begin to perfect it as you go. And it begins to take on identity. And you've got to sometimes pass up some good things to do the greater things, because part of branding is messaging. And if you're doing a million different things and you're like, well, my, my this is that better, my that's better. But does the public see it? Find that lane and then begin to become intentional in doing it. And it doesn't matter where you're, you're functioning from if you if you take that stance. And you have to yeah. be confident. You can't yeah. apologize for it. That's the other thing. I think when yes. people are working out of Absolutely. their home or working on the road and, and they start with, oh, where's your studio? Well, I got, you know, I work out of my house or whatever. Like, right here. Own that, you know? Like you, it's yeah. in my car. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, it's wonderful. You know, what you have to do is take your situation, your environment, where you are at, and say, okay, what's my advantage? Just like Tim was saying, yes. you know, when I first started out in my studio in Pasadena, I worked out of my house and my advantage was I spent more time building up relationships with my clients. I would deliver the portraits. We would do the sales in the home. I would hang the portraits up in the homes. You know, when uh, holidays came around um, that every year, I took presents for to thank people for being part of my, uh, Taylor Fine Portraiture Studio family. And, you know, I had more time. And I, so I took advantage of that to build up relationships. Now, there's and, two, uh, two ways of, I, I wasn't sure if the question was, can I have a studio in my home? Mm -hmm. Or can I just have home be the base, but I do everything on location? Because if you do have somebody come to your home, I do think that's not the day you cook cabbage. <laughs> that's not the day you let your, your dogs run in the mud and then run in the house. Uh, but, you know, like, like we've, every crossroad we've ever come to where we moved to a different location, we had to sit and think, and we called, we actually called photographer friends that had home-based studios. And every time we determined, let's get a commercial location, we didn't want to mix the two together. And a lot of that is because we had some commercial work that wouldn't have come to us in a home. But uh, one lady I thought was very inventive. She worked out of her home, but her home was small. She didn't do any portraits there. But when she had to meet the client, she actually rented an office, a small office in a commercial building, really historical, cute little building downtown. And so when she had to meet the client 
for the planning and all that. And then for the selection, uh, she had a little kind of an office space that she rented. I thought that was creative, a creative way to do it. So they never saw her home. They, the client never went to her home. Yeah, and today you can actually rent a studio, you know, or do things yeah. like that too. There, there's some mm -hmm. really nice uh, locations and places and things you can run out if you want to do that. But there's no reason you can't do it from your home either. You just have to own it. Like, and yeah. put yourself yeah. as a client coming through and mm -hmm. say, what can I do to make this as professional experience okay. for people to come right. through as I possibly can? What are all the things, the sights, the sounds, the smells, the touches, you know, what's like the, you know, the know. nicest thing that I can afford, you know, that they will see when they come through here that, that feels comfortable for them. And so um, for me, it was a, you know, a wicker couch. And then I put some cushions on it. That was all I could afford at the time from Home Depot. But <laughs> It worked. You put, you put bars, <laughs> bars on the windows, Rod. Right? Yeah. <laughs> there were bars on the windows. I, lo I love that story, Rod. Right? You're that awesome. You, can, you really can. You can, you know, tell the truth in advance, you know. And it, I think we're all saying the same thing. It's all about your mindset. Right. About where you're at. And try to, like, I've had a lot of, I've had so many mentors in my life. I mean, these guys in front of you are some of my best mentors I've ever had. And um, I admire them so much. And, but I, you need to see it for yourself. So, you know, if you can go stay at a W hotel. Go um, have a really, really nice dinner, you know, somewhere at the fanciest restaurant. What kind of experience was that? And look around and see what are they doing to elevate the experience for people when you're there. And then take some of those elements and how you can put that into your business. That's good. Yeah, great advice. I love that. That's, that's a great one. Now, I don't know if you guys want to feel this one, but I'm throwing it out there anyway. So we're going to do it. <laughs> Uh, Deb, Deb's joining us on Vimeo and wanted to know, uh, I think this plays into it great. Uh, if you're getting more calls for location portraits, but you really want to transition into say studio, do you keep taking the jobs on, but showing the studio work until you're known for it? How do you go about, you know, shifting, making that shift and making that jump? Yeah, that's, you're exactly right. Deb is you need to do that. So keep showing studio work it's like, if I photograph a family of, you know, 50 people, I am not going to put that on my website, because I don't want to do that, you know. Right. Uh, no, thank you. That's Amen. just not my thing, you know, or babies, you know, all bundled up in a whatever hanging from a tree. That's not my thing. <laughs> so um, don't put that on your website. You might be really proud of it. You know what I mean? It's like, wow, I accomplished that. I can't believe I did that. It's so beautiful don't and amazing, it. but it's totally out of what I normally do. Don't show it. So start dropping off the things you don't want to do as you can afford to. And then what we do is, or what I've been taught is to start kind of pricing yourself out of the business, you know? So you start moving up one thing and replacing it with another um, is what you do. And that's what's worked for us is that mm -hmm. you have to be careful. I mean, you have to do it over time, but um, you certainly have a goal in mind. And um, yeah, the less you show of the outdoor stuff and more of the indoor images, you're definitely gonna be known for that and get more calls for that, so. Yeah, if you wanna do less of that, you can do something like adding a location fee uh, to that sitting, you know, mm -hmm. it's gonna be $150 more, if we go on location or 250 or whatever it is, you're not saying no. But you're just saying you're putting a little tiny hurdle up there, and giving them a chance to look at the other products that that you are doing, like the new studio portraits that you're and then, doing. In the meanwhile, you have to build up that studio library. So, I mean, the, the library of images of studio portraits. Mm -hmm. So in the meanwhile, you have to be inviting people in, doing complimentary sessions. Like you just need to build a portfolio. And I think sometimes too, like, photographers feel like they can't do something like that. Well, everything has to be paid or we can't, you know, we can't offer something like that. But if you're trying to build a, a new product line or a new line on your website or 
a new, a new, something you want to be known for, absolutely call some people, call some old clients and say, I'm trying something new. Would you mind coming in and, and modeling for me? Or some of these people that are calling you for location sessions, they might just be asking for location because that's all they've seen of yours, right? So they're coming in because of that. And so sometimes it just is like, well, you know what, I'm, let me do the location for you. But would you mind if after that you came by the studio, I'd love, you know, I'm, I'm playing with some new lights, some new gear, a new style. I'd love to um, shoot some in the studio also. So I would say, try and leverage those people if they don't have small kids and it's not going to be super hard for them to last, but then just call some people in. And like Rod said, just let the location stuff start dropping off, start start curating your Instagram feed more, your website more so that that's what you're really showing because yeah. people oftentimes just don't know what to ask for. Yeah, people a lot of times, yeah, they don't know what to ask for. They just don't have the knowledge. You know, right. we're here every day, every minute involved totally into our studio, but they're not, you know, yeah. they're coming here after maybe not doing a portrait for five years, 10 years, yeah. whatever. They don't know our industry. They don't know intimately what we're doing so right. but that's what we have to do by educating them and telling them about our style our new products whatever it is yeah, i don't, I don't do blame guys... the clients for that you know what i mean i yeah. see it as my issue you know that i haven't educated them properly and um so yeah that's how i look at it how, how do you know where to draw the line when you have somebody who is dancing that line say between styles or or studio or on location or trying to maybe mix in both how do you know obviously monday morning quarterbacking is easy we can always look back at what we've done in the past and say okay well i made clearly made a mistake here and this clearly worked out but when you're in that position where you might have somebody who has taken the leap of faith to leave maybe the corporate world and open up their own portrait studio how much is too much like how do you know okay where do you draw the line between all right i just got to get jobs through the door or I'm going to stick to my guns and I'm going to say no. Is there any, I mean, I know it's very situational, but is there any overarching advice that you can give to somebody who might be newer and testing the waters? How much should they put up with or how much should they kind of stretch the bounds of what they're willing to do? And I can talk about that because I did leave the corporate world. I used to work for Citibank. I was a manager for them. And um, at one point, you know, I was doing portraits on the side and at one point, um, I think it was my manager above me came and said, you know, you need to make a decision. What are you going to do? And I'm like, I'm out of here. So, um, which was really scary because yeah, I had a good, I had a great corporate job. You know, I had six weeks vacation and all the benefits and all the things. And now I'm um, eating macaroni and cheese and hot dogs <laughs> and working a ridiculous amount of hours. And so it, you have to build I mean, there is a process mm -hmm. of going through what you're doing. And so you need money, you know, so you have to make money where you can. Um, you need uh, a reputation. You need people to know who you are um, in the community. And so that all takes time to develop and you can strategize and work toward those objectives. But, you know, sometimes um, when you're in that process, you're doing things that, you know, I'm photographing a puppy at three o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. I'm never going to show that to anybody. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to put that out there anywhere, but if it helps me, you know, kind of get through to where I want to be and never lose where you want to end up. Always keep yeah. in mind, this is temporary. I said that to myself thousands of times. This is temporary. This is not where I'm going to end up. This is not where I'm going to be long term. This is temporary. I'm working till two o'clock in the morning. I see nothing, but I, I visualize what I would be doing in a, in, in a few years from there. And when you ask your, when you tell yourself that your brain comes up with a response, comes up with answers, you know, it really does. So if you say, oh, I'm a horrible photographer and I'm not making any money, I'm sure it's all my fault. You know, well, yeah, your brain's going to just reinforce that. But if you say, this is where I want to be, how can I get there? Um, you're, over time, those things will start coming to you and you'll start saying no to, to certain things and, and understand and get better education and better photography and all the things will happen. So, But don't you think, Rod, too, like I think a, a huge reason that that worked for you is because you took the time up front like to answer some of those questions we had 
on the slides at the top. So you knew what the end game was that you wanted. And so then you can, if you, like you said, Derek, if you just need to pay the bills, you right. And you got to take an event job. Maybe you don't normally do events, but you got to pay the rent. I mean, we all have to do sometimes things that aren't the ideal, but the difference is knowing that you are intentionally making that choice that it's a choice. It's not like something you're just blindly like panicking and saying yes to this and yes to that and yes to this. Like if you can define where it is you want to end up, then you can choose which things that you may have to sacrifice for and why, and it will help you get through that more easily knowing what the end game is and that you, that it's been a conscious decision. Don't you think? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep. Great stuff. So, uh, so should we, should we take another question? Should we do it guys? Sure. Why not? We're here anyway. Yeah, right? let's do it. <laughs> so, so I like, I like this question a lot because I think this is something that we're, we're all kind of keyed in on. And I know, I know from following Monica and Michael, you guys, you guys are great at this. And so I think you're going to have a great answer, but, uh, I'm sure that I'm sure that Rod and Tim and Bev are going to chime in too. Uh, Patty wants to know. Uh, she said, "I've redefined my focus from high school seniors to black and white studio portraits of children." Thank you, Tim and Bev. <laughs> How do I best let people know about the change? I'm mostly posting on Instagram, and the inquiries are very quiet. Do I start doing emails, Facebook ads? What do I What do I do there? Redefine my focus from high school seniors, black and white studio portraits of children. And how do I best let them know? I think the same thing uh, we're kind of talking about, right? You guys like yeah. filtering off. Like, so we used to do, I used to do weddings. I used to do a lot of weddings. And when I decided to, that I didn't want to do weddings anymore and I wanted to just do families and children, it doesn't happen overnight. So you had to, I had to kind of do the math and figure out, okay, well, how much income do I need to replace over here on the portrait side? And so all of the things that I was showing wedding, wedding, weddings, and back then we didn't have back then we didn't have yeah, back in those days yeah exactly <laughs> so, <clears throat> back in those days it was providing mm -hmm. prints for all of our vendors right providing beautiful image boxes for all the florists and all the dresses and all the things so if you um it, so that kind of has to scale back and then you have to start replacing it with the things that you want to do and being out there and building relationships and building um connections with other businesses small businesses and i think that what I'm really glad to see is this pendulum shift the past several years in photography education back to business, right? Like yeah. for decades, it was just shooting, shooting, shooting. And so, yeah. which is great, but now like, but everybody went out of business because nobody knew how to run a profitable studio. So now it's all business, which is great. However, I find myself having to say to people over and over again, you need to be shooting, 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 shooting. And they're like, well, the phone's not ringing. I'm like, go find somebody like photograph. You got, you have to be photographing all the time, all the time, every week and coming up with that content and pushing it out there and doing your newsletters, putting up samples around town, inviting people in doing, um, doing a like fundraising activities with nonprofits in your area to get your portrait work out there. Like there's a million ways to do it, but again, kind of planning it out and building, building it by intention, slipping away the other things. And really just when we launched a new product line a couple of years ago, we annually donate photography to a nonprofit, um, locally to us. And that year I said, you know, I know we normally do these out on location or whatever, but we've, we've launched a new studio portrait line. I'd love to do the photography this year in that, in that style. Mm -hmm. And they were like, great, you know? And so just, again, just kind of trying to replace, you know, and I'll, let me add to what you're saying, Monica on, on that. And, and Patty, hello, Patty. I know, I know which Patty that is, I, even though I can't see you. Uh, she's amazing. I'm glad you're here with us. And I think too, the, the question was also about marketing and getting more people like that. We also have to think about not just how to market, but what's the message of our marketing. And I encourage anybody that, um, and I learned this from a dear friend, anybody that is getting, um, trying to hone in on their brand is to take three words, three keywords that you want to be part in order of importance and then keep those in front of yourself. Like for us, it's meaningful, intentional, 
and excellent. So we want excellence to undergird what we do, but we want a meaningfulness to our work where it touches people. The point I'm making is the type of marketing you're doing is sometimes it's about just tweaking the message a little bit, marketing the result of your brand, not your brand. A lot of photographers market best lighting in town or, you know, award winning. And I don't want to step on any toes here. I, winning awards is wonderful. But ultimately, if you look at it from a client's vantage point, is what's in it for me from a client's vantage point? How do you make their life better? So marketing, and I know we'll talk about that another time. Marketing has a lot of processes and a lot of avenues but you can waste a lot of money marketing and advertising if you're just all over. So I would say stay the course, clarify your message, make your marketing about other people, market the result, not the photography. Photography to me is just the vehicle we carry the message on. It, it, it's like Bev said, you could paint, you could do something else. I would still have the same message. My message isn't dependent on photography. My message is dependent on my passion, my drive and what I want to do for the people I serve. Photography happens to be the vessel or the vehicle I carry that message on. So we have to, as we market, we have, and as we build a brand, we have to think very closely about, uh, about carrying that message out as the result. And for us, it really began years ago when we began, instead of marketing about ourselves, we started telling the stories of the people we photographed, celebrating them. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, it wasn't until the end of our ads and our blogs and things like that where they even knew it was a Walden uh, a piece. And so these other people became evangelists for us just by carrying that message out. So it's that kind of that law of reciprocity. And I think when you build a brand, if you can also think not only about how to take the message out, but what is the message? How does it make a client feel? Take yourself out of where you are, put yourself in the heart and minds of your clients. It's like, how can you serve them? What are the things that you can do that will change their life today and even more so tomorrow as they look at that art? And then you begin to market that way. Sometimes the marketing you're doing can become effective because you're just taking a little different twist to it. This is this is why nobody so wants to go after Tim. <laughs> because yeah. it's always like it's always a mic drop. It's always, can we just print that and frame it and hang it above our desk? Because yes. that, that's one of the first things I remember, Tim, from taking your classes years ago was you know, we don't sell art, we sell the result of the art, we sell the way people right. feel when they look at the art. And I've I've carried that with me for a long time and 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 I always I always think of that. So I do too, Tim. I've stayed with you also, as you know. So in your studio, <laughs> you, and the thing with you know, I, I love these guys dearly. They're amazing. But I think you're also saying, Tim, you're the oldest one on here too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not, they're not because they're good friends. It's so uh, good. I don't, I don't know. Like, Michael, Michael did reference uh, uh, using a brownie. So I, I yeah. know. <laughs> well, I know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I had the second generation brownie, Michael. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I think I think that's a that's a great place to kind of tie tie a nice little bow and and pull it nice little wrap job for for now because I I know we've got another three sessions coming up our next one's going to be next week Thursday July the fourteenth same time same place five to six p.m. different link so uh, if you want to join that one which hopefully you do I think there's a lot of great information and a lot of great different perspectives that are being shared, which is really fun to do to see everybody's unique ideology on, on, you know, a very common theme. So make sure you visit the event space page and make sure you go and pre-register for that one so that you have the proper link. Um, if you're not watching on zoom, that's okay. You can still watch on Vimeo as well as Facebook, all that stuff will continue to be the same and we'll have that information posted. Um, for those who, who aren't already and who haven't had a chance to yet, um, where, where can people now start to follow you? If, if you weren't, if hey, you should... so this is super duper exciting. So we did put a link. I don't know if you guys are able to put it for the people who are watching on Facebook and Vimeo, but, um, Bev and Tim put together a lovely PDF all about defining your brand and style. And so that's free to you guys. We love for you to have that. Um, and there's a link to download that. So we hope you'll, you'll go do that. And we'll have a little something, a little parting gift for you each week. Um, so 
what we're really excited about is that we are in the process of putting together a really comprehensive education for portrait photographers. We feel that there's a need in the marketplace. We're watching photographers who want so desperately to, to have successful businesses just kind of have to piecemeal together their education. And there's more education out there than ever before, which is a good thing, but it's also hard to know, well, is this person the right way or is this person the right way? Like who do, who do we do all of that with? So we're in the process of putting together a website that's going to have like a ton of free resources and education and all of the things. We're not quite ready to say that name yet because we're still building it, but hopefully in the next couple of weeks, definitely by the end of this series, we'll have that to share. And, um, and, and super like little sneak, cheap sneak, but we are going to be launching a podcast. So we're so excited about that. Where um, Derek, that watch in. out, watch out, Derek. We gotta, we gotta, you know, protect our jobs here. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you guys can be guests on our podcast. Yep. Whoa, <laughs> hey, we go black. I'm out. <laughs> listen, all 12 of our people are still going to listen to you. Don't you worry about it. Don't you worry about it. But anyway, so we're just really excited to be together and um, and we'll share some of those resources as we go through the class. But definitely go get the style worksheet now because that's it's really, really comprehensive. The, the brand helpful. worksheet. Branding. branding. Sorry, branding. Sorry, sorry, branding. Yes. Yeah. And for anybody who did not get your question answered, I know we when we have 10 people, by Scott's count <laughs> on a panel. There's a lot, there's a, there's a lot of insight to be heard and we, we can't always get to every question, but we did take note of any questions that we didn't get to. So uh, for those of you who didn't get your question answered, we didn't forget about you. Thank you for, for joining us. Thank you for your time and for getting your questions in. So we, we do have plenty of sessions to circle back around on that as well. And you can also reach out to any of us on Instagram. We're all on there and um, and happy to Except for Michael, he won't answer you on it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. uh, you can send him to me and all that. I, I still alone. like you, but I just don't answer. <laughs> <laughs> I love, I love, I love that I have Derek here. He's, he's just making sure that, you know, I'm, I'm not missing anything with my job here. It's great. It's great. <laughs> yeah. over, we're over we're trying to keep him around for a session too. That's the goal. <laughs> Maybe go. Scott's I, seeing double or something. I don't know. How do you still don't know how he got to 10? You know? <laughs> I, I, I just, I just go with a number that that's nice and round. That's, that's the trick. <laughs> I don't I don't like odd numbers. You round uh, up. Okay, you round up. Okay. Who was who was man in the kill switch? This was this was great. Honestly, I, I know we have everybody looking forward to the rest of the sessions. I know I learned a lot and I already knew. My, we gave Monica and, and Michael the green light. And then when we sat down with the uh, you know, Rod Bev Tim. And just got to know you guys. We already knew it was going to be good. So this completely delivered. So I want to thank you guys personally on behalf of our team here at BNH uh, for coming back and doing this. Oh, thank and, you guys for. Yeah, it's an honor. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Education. I mean, you know what, Derek? If, if I guess I'll just go. You know. <laughs> 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 so uh, I think I think that wraps it up. Make sure you get in and make sure you register for that event because I'm telling you, you guys don't want to miss the rest of these events. There's tons of great information, and uh, you're you're only doing yourself a disservice if you don't sign up for it. So that's my endorsement for there. No biases. I I really believe in it, but. Uh, Again, I, I want to, you know, mimic the same sentiment as Derek, Rod, Tim, Bev, Monica, Michael. I want to thank you guys for being here. Even Derek for showing up and, you know, being <laughs> a partner in crime being to my yang over here. It's always, it's always good to, you know, co-host events together. It's always a great time. But uh, that's all the time we have for tonight. We hope to see you back here on the 14th of July at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So if you're on a different time zone, Google it because I don't know where you are, but <laughs> and uh, we'll see you back here this in another edition of the B and H virtual event space. I know. Go Scott, find out yourself. Scott's, Scott's surprised there's other time zones. You know? <laughs> we, we don't want we don't want him to start figuring out time zones. Not definitely. Not. Yeah. To hell with you. <laughs> yeah. uh, we'll catch you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.